All right, welcome back, everybody. It's Free Therapy Wednesday. Ooh, we love free therapy. Absolutely. Each week, we like to check in with our friend, Dr. Laura Saunders, for a little mental health boost. And today, we're talking about a, something that a lot of us might deal with, but especially if you have teens, uh, social anxiety. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Saunders. Hello, friends. Happy Wednesday. This is my favorite day of the week to be here with you. Well, thank you so we, much. We, we, love, we it. love it, too. Um, <laughs> so one out of three adolescents between the ages of uh, three, 13 and 18 suffer from social anxiety? Yes. And it's I think it's something that's um, not talked about enough in terms of how it affects our teens. And, you know, I'm always making a plug on this. I think it's worse because of um, devices media. and, uh, you know, electronics and video, like people just don't interact all in their neighborhoods anymore the way they used to 20 years ago. Right. I mean, I, you know, I don't know if it qualified as an actual disorder, but I can remember, especially because of Snap Map, we've talked about this, like my daughter when she was younger, not wanting to go into some place because they look at the Snap Map and be like, oh, all these people are in there and they don't want to face it. So what exactly are the real symptoms so we know if you have an actual disorder? So it's marked by an ongoing and pervasive fear of a social interaction. Hmm. And it's usually like a fear of embarrassment. It's a fear that something, you know, big or tragic will happen. Um, and obviously that fear is unfounded. And so what I worry sometimes for young people is that while sometimes social interactions can cause a bit of anxiety, it doesn't necessarily meet the criteria for a disorder. However, the way that you address it is by exposure. It's by stepping into it and dealing with it. Mm. So you're talking, you say demeanor, a child who is inherently shy, withdrawn and or apprehensive to try new things may be at an increased risk for development of this social anxiety. Yeah, kids who have kind of underlying dispositions or underlying vulnerabilities. We all know, like, as parents, we know, you know, this child's a little bit more anxious than, than this child. So we know that those kids who are a little bit more vulnerable to anxiety are more likely to have some difficulties in social interactions. Hmm. So as far as our parenting style, um, how do we as parents affect this or how can we help it? Yeah. So it's also to be noted that a very overprotective parenting style where you're like, no, 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 don't do that. Or no, I don't know if you should go do that. Or I don't know that kid. You can't interact with them. All right. I mean, you're sending messages that people are scary. So being, uh, note, note your own parenting style and how that may contribute to your child's social anxiety. All right. You say speech problems sometimes, uh, contribute to social anxiety, being bullied, the, all, those two things as well. Yes, there are definite risk factors. Any, any young person who has any type of disability or has had experiences with being bullied is going to have more fear in new social situations or sometimes even ongoing social situations. Right. So unfortunately, any type of disability can sometimes set someone up to feel a little bit more vulnerable. So this is a two part question. How do we know if it's really social anxiety disorder? And then what do we do as parents you said exposure is a solution. How do we help them get over it? So it, it, whether it's just sort of a, a, an, an issue or it's an actual disorder, the treatment is still the same. It really is exposure. It's finding ways to step into those situations. And it is having some skills. I mean, you know, having like, here's a starting sentence or here's a starting question you can ask someone when you're there, right? It's having some skills, it's practicing some scenarios that the, how you address it is still the same, whether it's just an issue or it's a full-blown disorder. Well, that sounds like good advice to me. Exposure therapy, that's what my doctor always wanted me to do, even with OCD. Well, uh, now, and if your child is saying though, like, no, I can't go in there, mom, I can't go in there. I think I also read that you're not, like, we don't force them. That, that's not that ex kind of exposure because, uh, oh, you're fine, let's go in and go drag them into the situation. That's not gonna work. Right, and, but exposure is just that, it's stepwise. So it might be, I can't go all the way in there, Okay, well then go up on the go up on the stairs and then come back, right? Or or walk out of get out of the car and then come back. Um, so it, it is a graded experience. It's not like an immersion 
You know, mm -hmm. we're not throwing mm -hmm. someone in the water that can't swim. It's a stepwise experience. So this time you get up on the stoop. Next time you actually go into the house and you only have to stay there for five minutes. Then the next time you have to stay there for 10 minutes. So it is a graded experience. Okay. All right. All right. And uh, again, one out of three teens, adolescents. So we're going to talk about this more on the Karis Cure Show and podcast. So you can take a deeper dive. Find it wherever you get your podcast. Dr. Saunders, thanks so much. Have a great day.